Good afternoon and welcome to Pan African News on Pan African Television with me, Maud Yana Ninati. We're streaming live on Facebook at Pan African Television. A very good afternoon to our 32 neighboring countries watching from far and near. Now let's move on to our top stories making headlines. Farmers in Saboba cry for aid. Uh, police pick up four persons in connection with Prof. Benet's suspected murder. Um, 2020 BEC start off today. Moving straight to our business phone to bring the farmers optimistic about farmers from waste plant. This and many other stories including international sport and entertainment. Coming up in the next one hour. Stay tuned. Now moving on to our first story, the torrential rains and spillage of Begri Dam in Buno region, Burkina Faso, sorry, which claims several lives and properties in the northeast region. Um. The recent rains has flooded the Saboba district and washed away farms worth millions of Ghana cities, leaving the farmers stranded and hopeless since farming is the major occupation and source of livelihood for greater population in the district. The district has also been cut off from neighboring districts like Yendi through to the northern regional capital, Tamale, thereby affecting trading activities in the district. The road leading from Saboba to Yendi through the Bal Balba Bridge has all been flooded, causing the bridge to be submerged in the flooded waters, making movement of vehicles and motorcycles impossible. Pedestrians and motor users who risk their lives plying the Saboba to Yendi through the Wapo Road will have to spend several hours on a canoe to get to Wapo before boarding a bus to Yendi district and proceed to the northern regional capital. Tamale. The alternative road from Saboba through Waupo to Yendi is the only way to and from Saboba has two commercial vehicles stuck in the water. An interview with one of the affected farmers, Emmanuel Yada, by Pan African News, whose farm crops has completely been washed away by the flood, lamented about the devastating effect of the flood on his family and other communities along the river. And as we all can witness or see, this is a situation that we found ourselves in. It's a serious situation. All our farms, maize, beans, I mean, a lot of things, farm, I mean, yams are being washed away by this uh, flood. So all our hope is finished. So we are just calling on government to help us as a matter of agency. He should help us because uh, you, you can imagine a farmer having hope that I'm farming this thing to harvest and take care of my children in school. And at the end of it, everything is washed away. What are you going to depend on? So we are just calling on government to come to the aid of people of Saboba. And the, the most important of all is that this is a major road linking to six communities. This is Jitchenu Community 1. And many people are from Kucha, Botwin, Samboli, and then Kacheni, they are all crossing here. And it is only two canoes that we are using to cross this number of people. Students, I mean market women, some of them are coming to grant. Others are coming to buy their, I mean, salt, or a lot of things that people need in town to come and buy. And these very few canoes, how can we depend on this to save life and property? So we are just appealing to government on power to, to come to the aid of Saboba. At least the Chenu community give us, even if you cannot help us at all, two canoes, only, only two canoes to be able to cross people. Students and then a lot of things, many things are coming from farmers to town for buyers to buy and send it to a crowd. So if all these things are lost, in fact, we are just appealing. We are just begging government to come to our aid so that uh, at least it will help us to be able to, to cope with the next life ahead of us. Taking a trip in a canoe to some communities that were cut off from the districts such as Buntun, Kachini and Kucha, you have to spend approximately three hours before you can land and then proceed to the main river where you have to spend like three 
to four hours to get to the communities. The parliamentary candidate of the new patriotic party in the Saboba constituency and executive director of Ghana Supply Company, Mr. Abraham Binan Padam Jawol, who donated a canoe to people along the alternative road that Saboba Wapo to Yendi to aid the people cross to and out of Saboba. Abraham Binampadam Jawol also called on National Disaster Management, NADBO, government and philanthropists to come to the aid of the people of Saboba to help relieve them of their situation, he added. So realizing this, I had to put in um, an emergency uh, measure. Okay. Uh, so I had to make available a boat that will help uh, the people to commit to and fro from Saboba. So I'm taking, and I know that that boat is not uh, enough, it's just one, and the human traffic that uses that road is so huge, because it's even totally impossible for us to use the other road. So I'm appealing to government, I'm appealing to the Ministry of uh, uh, Roads and Highways, to come to the aid of the people. I believe that this is the time for them to study the roads and to see what can be done when uh, the floods are over. Darling, the district director of NADMO for Saboba, Mr. Yahaya Ali, has been speaking to the cost of damage of the flood. Um, uh, as of now, in the Saboba constituency, I think all the roads has been cut out uh, from Palba to Saboba to Palba, Saboba to Wapuli. I think nobody can go to out, nobody can go out of Saboba, and nobody can come in to Saboba again. Away from that, the Greater Accra Regional Police Command has picked up four persons in connection with the suspected murder of the University of Ghana Law Lecturer Professor Yao Yimano Bene. The four who are reportedly being interrogated by the police are dem uh, domestic workers at a disease resident at Adrigano in Accra. According to the Public Relations Officer, of Accra Regional Command, Ifia Tenge, the four have come under suspicion after the incident. She said the four suspects picked up by the police are domestic workers in Professor Benes' house at Ajeringano. She stressed that all the four persons are currently being interrogated as part of police investigations. Professor Benes' body has since been conveyed to the police hospital morgue in Accra. Professor Bene is said to have been murdered at his Adjuringano residence in East Ligon after his mutilated body was found on Saturday morning. His legs and arms were tied as his body was found between his living room and bedroom. Until his demise, Emmanuel Yalbene was a senior lecturer with the Faculty of Law at the University of Ghana, Ligon. Hello. So we've been joined on phone by Fawuz, um, Fawuzu Masawudu. He is a reporter here at Pan-African Television. Fawuzu. Hello. Fawuzu, can you hear me? Hello. Fawuzu. Hello. Okay, so... So, Fawzu, what have you gathered so far? So, I, currently you are the resident of the disease. So, can you tell me what exactly is going on in the, in the resident or in the house of the late exactly. Yao Bene? Okay, so it, it's a very calm atmosphere over here. And when we go there, the wind was drizzling, but um, it's settled now. And we realized that there was a, quite a heavy security presence. The CID, a group of CIDs were there, the police were there. The media police at the time were not allowed access and entry, and apparently because we were carrying out investigation. We also saw some few um, relatives who refused to speak to the media because um, investigations were ongoing. We also said, um, we, we said the word of two with some of uh, his neighbors, and they told me that Mr. Imano Yabene is a very kind-hearted person. Mm -hmm. He is that neighbor that we always want to go to, 
Um, that's why they are age different. He was like a friend to them. One lady reported the fact that he was also a grandfather to them. So that is what we have been we've gathered so far over here. Okay, but I wonder, were you able to find out what exactly happened before the murder of the, the lawyer, I mean, the lecturer? Okay, so as we know, in, in, in report by far, the, the incident um, came to happen on Thursday, but was discovered on a Saturday. And for now, the time that police um, investigations are ongoing, mm -hmm. and, so they, and they really cannot say what exactly happened, but some of the neighbors told me that the last day they saw um, the professor was actually on the third day. Okay. Third day, that was the last day they saw the professor. That's some of the neighbors. But I'm actually glad that um, yeah. investigation, we are not able to ascertain by far what exactly happened. Okay. The investigations are ongoing. Okay. Thank you very much, Fauzu. So that was our reporter, Fauzu, on the, uh, I mean, at the resident of the late Yao Bene, who was murdered recently. So we joined on phone again which is a security expert. He's in the person of Nana Apia. For, um, he is a former detective of the Ghana Police Service and also the CEO of Global Intelligence Security Analyst Center. Yes, we, he's going to be on the line shortly. But before that, let's move to the next story, and then we would have him on the line. Now the two... Okay, he's on the line. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello. Good afternoon and welcome to Pan-African News. Good afternoon and thank you for having me. Okay, so I'm sure you're abreast of the issue, I mean the murder case of um, the lecturer at the University of Ghana lawyer, pardon me, the lecturer of, um, what's his name? Uh, the lecturer, pardon me, can we move on? So as a security expert, what do you think we are doing wrong that we the measures we need to put in place to avoid such cases because cases like this has been going on we've not we've, we've experienced a first case which was about jb and so what what do you think we are not doing right as citizens to avoid such cases in our resident or our vicinity well uh, very good afternoon to your viewers thank you and i think uh, so many things are not working right and uh, we need to make sure that uh, our citizens will put our house in order mm -hmm. And in the first place, we need to take our personal security and safety measures uh, as, as very important to us before the police and the state institution will come in to protect us. Mm. Secondly, what is not working well, uh, why we see a lot of delay in the investigation as well as justice delivery system has to do with the fact that the processes of our investigation regime need to be really looked at and then how evidences are collected mm. also need to be looked at how we protect in the, uh, our evidence right from the crime scene it's a very dicey and very complex situation here because you are talking about a homicide you know crime which comes with its own complexity right from the minutes the crime takes place mm -hmm. and so if you are investigating such you know crime you need to put up a team mm -hmm. that looks so focused undistracted not stressful a team that professionally are well composed and at each point in time evidences are well collected and well protected so when these are done i believe that we can get to the end of it and get a justice you know, that will culminate in ensuring that uh, assurance and confidence in the public are well ignited. Now, we don't see that. And I think it's a wake-up call to the police. A lot of incidents have happened, ranging from JB as MP, Ahmed Swale as a journalist, and the panic also, and the GPHA boss. Mm. You can count a lot and a lot and a lot. All it means to us is that what is broken in the system that we are not being able to fix it? Is it that the motivation for the investigation regime is not that sufficient? If it's not sufficient, we need to look at the policy direction regarding that aspect. And I'm sure when we do that and do it well, we will be able to at least have justice delivery for the people or for the victims of such heinous crimes. Mm. Until that is done, I think citizens must 
the alert and must be awakened to ensure that we take our personal security very serious at every point in time. Mm. Now, the man got murdered. Those people per perpetrated the crime, they did not just wake up, get a day and act it. There were series of surveillance, series of activities that took place leading to the murder. How were all those things not able to detect them? What kind of people are living with him? Mm. What are their level of understanding of personal safety and security measures? And after the incident, how was the issue reported to the police? Mm. Within which period, how on time and quick were all of these got into the police? Yeah. All of this play a core factor mm. in terms of investigating this and getting the actual perpetrator. Four people have been picked up. They could be just a mere suspect. Mm. And so I don't want the police to just focus on the four people who have been picked up. Because you look at the man involved in the crime or the man who has been murdered. Mm. His stature, it tells you that this is somebody who will not be dealt with by just a commoner. Mm. So it's a wake up call for us to realize that the people those may be behind it could be people with higher and strength models. Mm. And therefore, the police must cast their net very wide mm. and be committed and willing enough that whoever is being hooked in, the person should be dealt with accordingly, mm. regardless of the status or regardless of connection, regardless of whatever he or she is. Mm. And I believe doing this will continuously put confidence in us as citizens. Okay, so let's move to the security aspect of it. Don't you think, uh, do you think our security personnel are up to tax? Because this case happened recently, I mean last week, and till now we still don't have the evidence or what happened exactly. What is the case? Do you think our security personnel here in Ghana are up to tax? Well, there's different, uh, there's a bit of, you know, uh, cut off in there because mm -hmm. I'm told the issue, the incident happened uh, three days to, uh, within some 48 to 72 hours before the police were informed. Mm. If that really happened, the likelihood of uh, certain missing evidences is very possible. Mm. Again, after the issue was reported to the police, the terrorist movement, the team that went to the scene, the scene, what measures did they put in place? Because in the first place, you get there, you cordon the place, then you make sure that you dispatch men to be on guard. Mm. You don't just leave the place for anybody at all to get access. Because you need to start picking up finger impressions, you do forensic, and making sure that you can get a thorough you know, evidence to support the investigation throughout. Mm. And so it raises other questions. Now, come to the professionalism of the investigators or the state security that are in charge. Uh, we have had a lot of time to commend them doing very professional job and then we have a series of issues also that raises the competence level of some of the officers involved in this kind of investigations and so we want to see that there is a repositioning which brings professionals to the core because some of these cases are always being handled by officers in charge somebody who is not below the rank of senior, uh, you know, assistant of the Senate of police. And so when that is done and the information, coordination, commitment, and the willingness, everything is in place, trust me, the team that are in charge of this investigation will look very focused. Mm. They can deliver and we can get correct evidence and the rare perpetrators will be fished out to face the full rigors of the law. Mm. And so I wouldn't uh, want to damn the spirit of the security men. I believe we have experts in there, we have professionals in there, we have people who are committed to do in there. But then again, I want to stress that the motivation of the investigators in the country as a whole mm -hmm. must be really looked at. We cannot have investigators who will use their own resources to follow up on cases and you don't get refund for them. Mm -hmm. This has been an issue I've been talking against and I wanted a policy to change it. Mm -hmm. The investigators themselves Sometimes you have to resort to using their personal resources, mm. especially monetary aspects. And when they follow up on cases, they're supposed to be refunded, reinvest, but that doesn't come. So at the point they get demotivated, 
and they wouldn't use their resources to go. And they want to see that the state every time will have to give them the money. By the time the state will provide it, it is late. Mm. And the evidence and the suspects are nowhere to be found again. Mm. And so the policy needs to be really looked at. And when we do that, I believe we can make a headway. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks for your time. So that was Nana Pia, former detective of the Ghana Police Service and also the CEO of Global Intelligence Security Analysis Center, talking more or throwing light on the security expert when it comes to murder cases here in Ghana. So before that, let's go for a quick break. More news is still on. Doctor malaria so no dank anti my ex yaria malaria ebe kokura obi wo honu ma na yemye ne yanso a so no dank gastro ke herba mister o mo beto dank phyto ke herba mister koko ebe ye hu aduma ma wapo no wapo so o tutu dank estro ke herba mister o be nya ho den ne wetimi anante make a food dank no nyina e dia ma mo na e be nya dwe nya bi we pharmacy shop ana herba shop o so pe dank nu a ye be ma obi pa cho mo number ye sen 026659 Three 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 zero. In Roy, or Bapen for, or Bob Mark Ranu for, and Yakola won't infuse to me an intimate. FD, I guess I a good deal crap for you, and Jatum said, eh? Now moving on to the next story, the 2020 edition of the Basic Education Certificate Examination will commence today, Monday, September 14th, and Friday, September 18, 2020. Um, at all designated examination centers across the country. The West African Examination Council says a total of 531,705 candidates are expected to write for this year's BEC in 2007 examination centers across the country. The Deputy Education Minister, Dr. Yao Osei Iduchum, said the government has made all important arrangements to ensure a smooth examination management of the Ghana Education Service in a statement also wished the candidates well. GES expressed their gratitude to everyone who played a role in helping the candidates prepare for the examination. It further assured that the examination will be conducted smoothly and in strict adherence to COVID-19 protocols. The Ghana Education Service also entreated all candidates, invigilators and supervisors to eschew from examination more practices during the period. So we have our reporter, Fawuzu Masawudu, online as well. We're going to talk more about the uh, BC examination. It takes off today. So we're going to find out the preparedness of the student, the measures they are putting in place. We're still in the COVID-19 era, and we want to find out how they are doing and how prepared they are. How, hello, Fawuzu. Hello, Maud. Welcome back again. So where are you currently? Which school are you in particularly? Yeah, I'm I'm currently at the Jowlu Jowlu um, Basic School. Yeah, so the these students are going to be at two ways first to prepare for English language. Okay. Yes, and um, I see the on break. Some students mm -hmm. are around here. So I'll try and establish myself. Give the needs of some of the students. Mm -hmm. And then 
ask them to answer. Hello. Okay. I'll be talking. So, I'll be talking one student here. Okay. Um, uh, your name? Your name? David Enchi. David, which school are you coming from? After the academy. After the academy. How was your first paper? What was it? Don't talk to my children. Don't Okay. So we are trying to establish more of the people to speak to. Um, but before that, let's talk about the measures they are putting in place. Well, yeah, so we're talking to some of the students. So we, we will get back to you as, as to when we get, so we are trying to establish contact with the supervisor. Sure, well. sure, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, I. A great meeting. Sure, but I still want to find out how prepared are they? I mean, are they taking the measures, the precautionary measures in terms they of They are COVID? very well taking the precautionary measures. Mm -hmm. um, they, are, they are not smart. Okay. They, 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 they are observing the, the safety protocols as well. The, there is a hand wash. The Veronica buckets are here. Sanitizers. Okay. I see some sanitizers mm -hmm. around. Me too, so, mm -hmm. um, tissues and what have you. So all the safety protocols I can report are in place. Also, they are setting arrangements. So the social distance has been well observed over here okay. in most of the uh, examination halls we entered. Okay. But are, are they done with their first paper? They are done with their first paper. Uh, what was that? What was that? What, what paper, paper was that? That was the English language. Okay. Okay. Yes. So their next paper will be RME, the okay. Religious and Moral Education. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. You, we, are, we are still on standby. We'll find out more. Very from, well, very from, well. Sure. Yeah. We'll call you back. Thank you, Fauzu. So moving on to other stories, Information Minister Kojo Pong Krumah has disclosed that the country would on Tuesday, September 15, 2020, host a conservative meeting on Mali's ongoing po political impasse. This comes on the back of President Leonardo Donkwe Kufuado's election um, as the new chair of the Economic Com Com Community of West African State, which is ECOWAS in Niger last week. The consultative meeting will be the president's first official assignment following his election. Addressing the press in Accra, Information Minister Kojo Opon Nkrumah explained that the meeting will form part of several efforts to resolve Mali's political crisis. Foreign Affairs Minister Shelley Ayokobotri has also condemned the political impasse in Mali and said the meeting was necessary to address the security threat and challenges confronting the West African sub-region. The crisis in Mali poses a major threat to the region if not dealt with appropriately. With a vast ter territory without effective governance and the operations of several splintered terrorist groups operating in the country, a deterioration of the Malian socio-political crisis poses a serious security, th security threat to the region. The country has come under three severe attacks since the military coup on 18th August 2020 with far-reaching ramifications on Burkina Faso and Niger. Reports indicate that while a number of people have been killed by the jihadists, more than 700 jihadist activities have been neutralized since the onset of the coup in mid-August. Such events should be considered a worrying sign for security and stability in the country and the region. The current situation in Mali may embolden the jihadists to undertake more attacks that will further cripple the country and destabilize the region. This is the reason why ECOWAS has deployed efforts to address the situation since it began in June 2020 and following the coup d'etat that toppled the government of President Keita on 18th August 2020 and his subsequent resignation and the dissolution of the National Assembly on 19th August 2020. Since the onset of demonstrations in Mali, ECOWAS has carried out a number of mediation activities. At the 57th Ordinary Summit of the ECOWAS Authority, which was held on the 7th of September 2020 in Niamey, Niger, heads of state reaffirmed their determination to ensure 
that constitutional order is quickly restored in the country with a political transition led by a civilian president and prime minister for 12 months. The authority maintained all the decision taken at its extraordinary summit of 28th of August 2020 and noted the ongoing consultations between the Malian stakeholders initiated by the National Council for the People's Salvation, CNSP. The authority also directed that the head of transitional government and prime minister, both civilians, be appointed no later than 15 September 2020. The consultative meeting being convened by the chair of the authority of heads of state and government on the political situation in Mali on 15 September 2020, that is Tuesday, at Pedwasi is part of the mediation efforts of ECOWAS to return Mali to constitutional rule and to prevent the political situation from deteriorating further. Prior to this, ECOWAS mediators have moved to resolve Mali's political impasse that erupted last month, demanding President Keita of Mali's resignation. The ECOWAS delegation held a marathon weekend of talks in the country's capital, Bamako, in their latest bid to calm tensions and called on the government, the opposition and civil society organizations to work together. Mali has come under three severe attacks since the military coup occurred in August 2020 last month. Now, a civil society organization, Adam G.H., has raised some key issues that the NDC must address in their next government. A communique signed by the Executive Secretary of the Civil Society Organization, Mr. Azubula Salam Yimano, stated that the NDC manifesto is not feasible if John Mahama fails to address the issues of multiple non-working ministries, the Ameritheft, a Japan agreement, amongst others. So I've been joined on phone, um, which is the Executive Secretary of Adam GH, which is the Anchoring Div uh, Democracy Advocacy Ghana, uh, Mr. Azubula Salam Himanuel. Hello, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome good to Pan African uh, News. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. So let, um, you actually released the press on the 12th of September 2020. And in your press release, there was a statement saying that, and I quote, uh, you indicated that if John Mahama failed to do the following in the next government, what, what do you mean by such a um, statement? Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. As you mentioned our name, we are anchoring democracy at Focus in Movement Ghana, and in short, it's Adam G. Okay. And what we are saying is that um, if you look at the manifesto it's out, Mm. by the NDC and they call the People's Manifesto. The argument out there is that where is the former president is going to get money to uh, accomplish all of them. As a total type of we have done our policies area so that um, as a country, I think we have enough money in this country. The only problem we have is how to manage and utilize those money into projects that can help the citizens. And uh, we, as a, a former president who was ruling the country with 18 ministers, indeed we are not surprised when the ruling government is arguing that the former president will not get money to uh, implement all those projects. Why? If you look at the current size of government, the 125 ministers, and the uh, nonsensical ministry created by the president, Nona uh, We realize that those ministries, if, we, if the top president get the law, as the next president wants to do, mm. and fail to scrap up all these nonsensical ministries, and reduce his ministers to the eight ministers, and decide to continue with this same ministry and this. 125 ministers, there is no way he can be able to fulfill this uh, promise. Why are we saying this? If you look at the 
ministry like uh, Ministry of uh, Senior Ministry. It is just a nonsensical institution. It does not have any value to this country. We know we have a vice president who can meet all the ministers. Mm -hmm. So that ministry is just a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And we can see that this PDF deal, this Ejapa deal, the Auditor General it is all the senior scandals and Americans to be created from the off of the So we can see that that particular ministry is just a ministry of corruption and not a senior ministry. It's a ministry that is really ruining the country's chance of development. If you look at the amount we lost from the PDF deal, that is one hundred and sixty years. That is to uh, uh, to a large extent that uh, all what is in this manifesto that they are talking about, they can implement it. But because of some very corrupt and fraudulent nature, we have lost all these money, and we are looking at the forty-five additional ministers that. The, uh, the President Namado has added to the existing uh, Asian ministers we used to have. If you look at how much we pay them every month, mm -hmm. if you look at the, uh, let's see, uh, the, the average salary of 8,000 Ghana cities, multiplied by 45 ministers, multiplied by the four years, it is almost 18.2 million Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. Only the uh, additional 45 ministers, without their VJ, without their allowances, without their house health, their drivers, and what of you. So you can see that the country is wasting huge sums of money when it comes to this huge number of ministers and nonsensical ministry created. It's not just a ministry like a Minister of Regional Integration. That ministry is just a waste of time. Mm. You know, they, they are making what work was just to create a, a new regime. After creating the new regime, what else? Nothing. Yeah. But if you look at the uh, 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 ministry like uh, Ministry of uh, Chief Council, yeah. put Ministry of Chief Council together with the regional ministry, and they can create this same region. Yeah. Because creation of new regions is an event. It is not an activity that you should be, you should create a ministry purposely for creation of new regions. When are we going to create new regions again? Yes, we have this same ministry who are sitting at that ministry, taking their salary and all their allowances. Meanwhile, even the the the, 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 the new region they have created does not even have a, a regional institution like a, 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 what you call police headquarters, a, a regional secretariat, hospitals, and lots of you name them. Mm. So you can see that this government is struggling to come out with projects simply because of the size of government. So if the former president is uh, seeking to leave this country once again, and uh, this is this manifesto. The only thing he can do is to make sure he cut off this nonsensical ministry and also increase and uh, also reduce the number of ministers we are having currently mm. so they can be financial free. If not, there is a serious financial burden on the country. Mm. You can imagine right now, an African TV, mm. you go and employ a whole lot of people who are not even redundant workers mm. and, uh, uh, and they are duplicate but they pull and whatever in the same position. Definitely, you can't pay them. And you end up running the whole TV station down. Mm. That is the, the state we found ourselves as a country today. Okay. The country is facing serious financial challenges based on the way we overspending the country with salary. If you look at the uh, uh, amount borrowed by this president, one hundred and $137 billion. Yeah. This money has been used for salary mm. to be non technical ministries and not and not performing ministers. So we can see clearly that as a country we have enough money in this country. Mm. The only thing we need to do is just to cut off corruption mm. and after cutting corruption we can to pay money for, for projects. Okay. If you look at the president travel last year or when when we uh hired uh, a traffic debt mm -hmm. for seventeen thousand US dollars per yeah. hour. Yeah. Multiply seventeen thousand US dollars per hour by um, uh, uh, seven days, mm. it's it, it huge sums of money. All these money can turn out to developmental projects. So you can see that this, this corruption and this uh, elephant style government mm. is the real reason why this government has no project to do. Mm. And we go around commissioning toilet facilities and they promising they will come out with tracker and you choose the tracker that you need to do to need it to forest and non existing bullet. Okay. So as a small society group that anchor for the democratic principle, mm. we are advising the president mm. that if he wants to succeed, let's say he get the not next uh uh term, he needs to cut down on the non surgical ministry or the ministers. And okay. if the poor president also wins, we also need to cut off all this non surgical okay. ministry. Okay.
Okay. And also cut down the size of money. Okay. Thank so you very much. Enough money for the okay. okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. So that was um, uh, Mr. Zubila Salam Yiman of the Secretary um, for Adam GH, uh, trying to deliberate more on his press release. Um, on the 12th of September 2020. Now moving straight to Tanzania. Tanzania President John um, Magufuli has been challenged to a televised debate by his rival Tundu uh, Lisu. Ahead of the next month election, President Magufuli is seeking a second five-year term amid concern of increased representation of opposition parties. Mr. Magufuli has not yet responded to the challenge. Mr. Lisu, the leader of Chandema Party, said a televised debate of the presidential candidates will be healthy for the country's democracy. He told a campaign rally that President Magufuli shouldn't be afraid of debating a person who has never been a president like him. He tweeted a footage of his Swahili address to the rally. <laughs> Na afya kwa demokrasia yetu endapo wagombea wakuu hawa wawili watakutanishwa katika mtahano utakao rushwa na televisheni zote za nchi hii ili waelezee maono yao na mipango yao kwa Tanzania kwa miaka mitano ijayo na kwa miaka mingi ijayo Sasa kwa vile kwa vile sijamsikia Rais Magufuli akisema chochote juu ya mdahano huo naomba nipendekeze kwake kwa vile amesha kuwa rais miaka mitano hata kuwa na hofu ya kushindana na mtu ambaye hajawahi kuwa rais kama mie So let's do some health Story, cinnamon is a great source of fiber, magnesium, and calcium. Its research tested benefits are diverse, but these are the big ones. Cinnamon has been shown to act as a powerful antioxidant. In fact, it beats out more than two dozing other foods in terms of antioxidant capacity. Inflammation is associated with a wide range of health issues, from skin conditions to autoimmune diseases and cancer. And studies have isolated multiple flavonoid compounds in cinnamon that have anti-inflammatory activities. Taking in cinnamon increases neurotrophic factors, which keeps existing neurons in your brain alive and encourages new estro in the blood. There's no established research on a direct link to weight loss, but all of its potential benefits, like curbing inflammation and balancing blood sugar, can contribute to helping you achieve a healthy weight. Cinnamaldehyde, a component of cinnamon that gives it its flavor and smell, has been shown to have antimicrobial and antifungal properties. But how that may translate into fighting infections in the body is not established. Now moving on to our business front. Um, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, top world cocoa producers through a joint initiative have conceived chocolate traders and makers to increase the price they pay for cocoa. Cocoa producing countries suspended the forward sales of cocoa beans, which had a negative impact on global prices that, in less than a month, chocolate traders and makers agreed to the idea of a 400 US dollar tons premium on all cocoa contract. The joint initiative, known as the Living Income Differential, will take effect in 2020-2021 season, which begins in October. This follows reports of these countries earning less than they invest. According to reports, ECOWAS member countries account for 68% of global cocoa supply. In the 2019-2020 seasons, they produce 3.4 million tons out of a worldwide total of 5 million tons. However, figures from the International Cocoa Organization show that these countries capture just 3% of global chocolate, 
although Cote d'Ivoire produced 2.1 million tons of cocoa in 2017, it's brought in just 3.3 billion U.S. dollars from the trade, compared to earnings of 22 billion from U.S. chocolate majors. On March 26, 2018, cocoa farmers and trade federations from Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana formed their first strategic partnership agreement. In July 2019, Côte d'Ivoire's Café and Cocoa Board and the Ghana Cocoa Board successfully imposed a pricing mechanism to help producers earn a living wage. This move will help ensure better pay to producers, coordinate production seasons, and set a standard price for producers to prevent smuggling along the border. In the first week of Julian Assange's extradition trial in London, witness sought to bring out the political nature of the prosecution against Assange, despite the prosecution attempt to make it appear otherwise. They also point out the opaque nature of Wikileaks' indictment in the United States with evidence against Assange yet to be shared to the public and the threat the case posed to press freedom. The first week of Julian Assange's extradition hearings in London came to a halt on Thursday, September 10th after a COVID-19 scare. The proceedings will now resume from Monday, September 14th. Shortly before this phase of the trial began on September 7th, the previous extradition request was withdrawn and a fresh indictment was issued by the US in August. Judge Vanessa Barretta confirmed that Assange now stands trial for the new extradition request. Assange did not get the opportunity to review these new submissions against him. Assange's defence made a request to either remove these submissions or adjourn the trial until January so that Assange can review these additions. But this was denied by the judge. The judge also excluded over 40 applicants for remote access to the trial without any reasons. This includes Wikileaks editor-in-chief Kristen Harafson, journalist John Pilger, Amnesty International and dozens of civil society and political monitors. The prosecution has been stating that Assange is only being tried for those leaked documents which named intelligence officials. This view was not shared by the witnesses testifying in defense of Assange. Clive Stafford Smith, founder of Reprieve, stated that during a potential trial in the US, all documents could be used against Assange. The witnesses also sought to bring out the political nature of his indictment. International security expert Paul Rogers pointed out that a large number of federal officials in the US are political appointees including those in the U.S. Department of Justice that is currently pursuing the case. The publication of leaked documents also altered the predominant narratives of U.S. wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. The expert witnesses also pointed the threat to press freedom posed by this case. Trevor Tim, co-founder of the Freedom of the Press Foundation, stated how the prosecution of Assange could lead to prosecution of other journalists and publishers. He said while WikiLeaks may not have had a sound editorial judgment, it was not for the government to advise media houses on editorial judgments. In the expanded indictment charges, Assange is accused of encouraging Chelsea Manning to share classified documents. Critics have dismissed this charge as this is a common media practice. This is the first time that the Espionage Act is being used against a publisher. Several US administrations have threatened to prosecute journalists for publishing classified information in the past, but never did it. The fact that President Donald Trump's administration is the first to do so is indicative of his strained relationship with the media. His administration has declared the press to be their enemies since the beginning. Several voices of support came together in support of Assange. Reporters Without Borders tried to submit a petition signed by more than 80,000 activists and groups to the British government to dismiss the US extradition request, but the Prime Minister's office turned them away. Demonstrations were held in several cities across the world in support of Assange. Iconic musician Roger Waters declared that he too had shown the collateral murder video. He said, if Julian is guilty, so am I. Julian is the contemporary equivalent of the head on a pike as a warning to others. Ex-Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva also defended Assange's innocence. He said Assange should have been treated like a hero for having denounced to the world the lies of the US State Department, investigating the world, investigating the government. All of the democratic countries should cry for his freedom. Comrade Eve Edwards is on standby with our sports news.